episode five. Can't believe it's been five hours of this already, along with nine hours of no more Mr. Nice Guy, but whatever. A couple of you guys may be coming here now that I've started streaming on Twitch. Recommended this thing. Come on in, check it out if you want to. Let's go back to... No, not this one. This one. What's going on, everybody? When I say no, I feel guilty. So if you've been watching this, you've probably seen the last four episodes, which are about verbal assertiveness, the reasons that you're not assertive, reasons you should be assertive, um, the ways people you manipulate you and that you don't put up with it because of your non-assertiveness. This one, actionable advice, conversational techniques, and it's a short chapter, but there's a lot of supplementary material around it that I think is going to be very worthwhile for you guys. So it starts off assertive social conversation and communication in both my general psychotherapeutic practice and in teaching people to be assertive. I have observed that to the degree which they are assertive, they are also socially adept. I have also observed that people who benefit from learning to be systematically assertive usually require some help in improving social skills. God knows I've talked to enough guys and you've heard me talk about enough how a spot of the tism is thing. A lot of guys are just not able to be social in a way that even a generation ago we had. Like, just use games as an example. Video games used to be something you had to go to a building. You had to go to an arcade to play. When you were at the arcade, you would go with your friends. Two players side by side. You had to stand there. You had to play together. It was a very social experience. Nowadays, it's sitting at home on your console, sitting there staring at your one player. Extremely good narrative game. Zero social interaction. So repeat this in like 100, 200, 300 little things that happen over a lifetime. And you're getting guys that just aren't able to socialize in the way they used to. Set up for failure, essentially. Not everybody, but it does raise the raise the numbers of it. Um, so the answer for this is a simple one, but it's implications to each of us and are important or even in potentially important relationships with other people. Communication is the glue that keeps people together, and while it grows and strengthens into a channel of mutual support, counsel, productivity, excitation, and satisfaction. Again, I don't entirely agree with this, because... And I get it. He's a shrink. So they're always going to come at this from the perspective of men and women being equal, responding to the same triggers, thinking about things the same way. And of course they're on the same team. They're married, right? Well, we kind of know better by now. It's about self-interest for the most part i'm actually gonna do i'm gonna do a new blog post on this one it's something i've kind of talked about in the while it's like how the trolley problem and girls picking up stray cats is kind of tied into the male situation here so it'll be a good one but back to the topic he talks about two important concepts free information and self-disclosure and when it comes to being better in conversation or more able to practice those social skills to be more assertive these are the two key points so free information is, in order to become an assertive communicator in a social setting, you must master two skills. First, you have to practice to listening to other people's or cues that they'll give you about themselves. Following up on this is free information people tell you and offer, which you have not asked about or commented on. It accomplishes two things in a social setting. The free information gives you something to talk about besides the weather and avoids those awkward silences in which you ask yourself, what do I say now? Um, so we're going to get to, I'll start off with like a pickup angle. Something that was very common when it first started was called the opinion opener. The idea is you're walking up to a stranger for the first time. Um, you wanted to establish a couple things. First off, that you're not going to be a time sink on the person. The bar was a sexually energized atmosphere. Girls are jockeying for status. Uh, a lot of guys walk up that they would consider losers that end up wasting their time talking about themselves and it just bores a person. So the first thing that they would do is come up with like something to say that I'm not here to waste your time. Put them off. Get that immediate like guard uh, out of the way. Then afterwards, you would uh, bring up an opinion about something. And the idea was you're basically fishing for free information. You know, I have to get back to my friends in a minute, you know. So uh, we're having an argument right now. He's saying it doesn't count as cheating when you're in a different zip code. I say it does. What do you think? 
Basically, it's free information, whatever they talk about. And whenever they talk about, you're able to leverage that into a conversation and move it forward. Now, it doesn't have to be that, and it doesn't have to follow this particular structure. But key points to follow are about free information. You can have just any conversation. This is why it's like a meme at this point, that if you're going to pick up a girl on social media, the worst thing you can say is just, hey, hey in the chat, because that does nothing. That offers zero information, and you're putting the onus on you approaching somebody or you messaging somebody for the first time on them to just freely give you information with zero topics. If you want to see how bad that works, talk to an artist and tell him, paint me a painting. He's going to stare at you like you got three effing heads. He's not going to know what to do. It's like, what do you want me to paint? I don't know, just whatever. They're not going to know what to do. And so they're either going to drag their feet or tell you to pound sand. On the other hand, you tell them, here, could you paint me a picture of my car? Well, that's something they can work with. And like, oh, okay, well, just so you know, my style is watercolor. So it's going to look like this. And that's when a conversation starts. It's something you'll learn too. Um, and I've suggested it to guys since the start. If you're very bad at communication skills, a good thing to do is take an improv class because they'll teach you this opening a conversation. For example, uh, there's an exercise that every class will go through. And I was doing it in high school, college, afterwards, through the military, whatever, that Anytime somebody gives you something, you have to agree with it with an and. Never use but. But is a closer of a conversation. But shuts things down. No shuts things down. No closes the communication. So whatever they send you, say and and say yes. And it's a good way to practice taking any clues from another person's communication styles. And some people are good at communicating back. Some people it's like pulling teeth. I'm going under the assumption that women are generally better socializers than men. So this opening thing allows her skills to reflect well on you. Again, same thing. She could ask, what are you, just some kind of, some creepy dude off the internet? Of course I am. I'm actually the creepiest one. But that's that what I mean? That agree and amplify is a way of opening up the communication. That uh, amuse mastery is a way of opening up the communication. And then the idea is you keep it open for a length of time and then you're starting getting free information back. And that free information you get back tailors how you drive the conversation moving forward. Uh, the second part, though, is self-disclosure. Assertively disclosing information about yourself, how you think, feel, and react to another person's free information, allows the social communication to flow both ways. So without self-disclosure, the following of free information would make a conversation stilted, give the impression that you're playing the role of interrogator or district attorney, or simply prying into the other person's life without sharing your own experience. One sec. This is why, again, back to the pickup the root of things, there was something called the cube. If you guys look it up, it's still up online. It was a nice, it's a nice routine you build when you want to build rapport with somebody. But the self-disclosure in this one is pretty clever. It's, hey, I have like a, you know, I have a shrink friend of mine from school and she showed me this thing. It was absolutely amazing. It's like she figured out my innermost secrets. Do you want, like, I'm dying to try it on somebody. Do you want me to try it on you? Again, there's self-disclosure. You know, I have a friend. They're in this program. There's this mental magic trick that they taught me that's absolutely insane and it freaked me out. Then the girl can open up and that's, again, what do they offer on this one? Oh, yeah, I love those kind of games. Or, you know, I'm not really into psychology and that. But that's the thing. They're gonna Your self-disclosure allows them to give you free information that you can tailor it. Now, I've never seen anybody turn it down because, you know, being able to read minds, it's too, it's too interesting for somebody. Like, they're not going to believe you. And they shouldn't because it's a flat-out lie. But it's made so obvious a lie that you're actually practicing the skills of conversation as opposed to focusing on the details of a conversation. And that's why a lot of guys have trouble with this. Because they're like, why would I talk to somebody if I'm just making stuff up, if I'm just telling a story, or if I'm, uh, if this is obviously not true? It's like, yeah, girls don't care about that. They don't, they're not at a bar. They're not being picked up. They're not having a conversation because they want to learn. They're having a conversation so they can get better at having conversations. And they're very good at it. And you're simply getting with the program and becoming what you would call socially adept and what girls would call having a high EQ. It's not really it's not really an EQ or an emotional you know quotient because it's not a genetic thing. It's a practiced thing. So in that way, it's not an EQ at all, but whatever. So if you've just been introduced to somebody new at a social function, better yet, you introduced yourself. You might ask that person, for example, do you live near here? Mary. And if Mary replies no, she's given you zero free information about yourself. But if, on the other hand, she replies, 
No, I live in Santa Monica or Santa Monica right near the beach. She's given you two bits of information that you didn't ask for. First, that she lives in Santa Monica. And second, in all likelihood, she likes the beach and goes there often. You might also get free information that she's married, has three kids, two dogs, and is simply waiting at the thing for her husband to arrive. In any case, what do you do with the free information when you're given it? And this is why I love the conversation of subtext. Right there, perfect example. I mean, I talk about it in my book as well, where uh, there was one of the chapters, the later ones, I think it's chapter eight, but the guys who have read it have been reading it more recently than me. So I sometimes get the chapters mixed up, but it was a section where if you're on a date with a girl and things are going well, then all of a sudden out of the blue, she looks at you and says, we're not having sex tonight. You know this, right? Right there, most guys get disheartened. It's like, oh, you know, it's whatever. I respect you as a person. I would actually wait till marriage myself. I'm a good guy. And again, that's that nice guy paradigm. If I do what I think she wants me to do, then I'll have a nice life problem free life. And if guys aren't good at communication, they just take that at a surface level. They don't realize the purpose of that statement. And they just say, I think she wants me to not want her for sex. And then they say that. And it turns out it hurts the girl's feelings. She never calls them back and she never takes his calls because she's embarrassed by that. Now, once you start understanding these purposes of uh, free information, and self-disclosure, what does that tell you? Well, why did she say that? And like he said here with the example of Mary, she gave you free information right there. A, she's thinking about sex. And B, she wants to make sure you know she's not a slutty girl. Now, whether she is or not, it's irrelevant. Doesn't matter. The point is, those two pieces of information allow you to self-disclose in a more socially adept or high EQ way. So in this case, yeah, of course, I'm always like a save it till I'm married kind of guy with the understanding. And then she gets the information back from your self-disclosure. Okay, he doesn't think I'm that kind of girl, but he said that kind of in an over the top way. So he still like I'm still able to get validation from him, carry on. And then you smash later and everybody wins. Other examples, you're making a new friend. He says, yeah, normally I don't invite uh, brand new guys to my squash party after work here. And you're like, yeah, that's fine. I'm actually not a huge squash fan anyway, but I do bowl on the weekends if you're there. But you see what I mean? Understanding the subtext of it. And in his case, it's I don't know enough about you to bring you to my close knit social circle in which you in which you can say, yeah, that's fine. Here's another like low investment activity partner type of thing. Let's find out if we jive as buddies and then maybe you'll we'll talk to your squash thing later. But that's the whole point. In teaching people to recognize free information, following up on it, and use self-disclosure, Dr. Smith here uses two practical exercises that he developed in the spring of 1970 at the Spevalda VA Hospital. The first exercise is to pair off with an arbitrary partner and simply practice following up with free information the partner gives. In this case, um, it's a good example of the no more Mr. Nice Guy breaking free exercises. Like if you have a friend, somebody else is doing it, practice this stuff. If you don't have a friend who's doing this or don't have somebody you can trust with it, there's like a subreddit, like the acronym NMMNG. Uh, one of my buddies does the moderation there. So if you start bringing when I say no, I feel guilty stuff, he'll know exactly what's going on and you're perfectly able to practice this stuff. But I find a nicer one, especially for guys that have this fear of rejection of approaching people, is to go practice this with day game. It's a wonderful purpose of day game when we say, go up, start a conversation, five conversations a day, five a week, whatever number, do the Leonard, do the Seymour Skinner thing. And every day I want you to break that record, just like you did with the basketball in the newspapers. But that's just it. Okay, so I'm going to go in this conversation. You want to systemize it. Okay, I'm going to go there. I'm going to give a self-disclosure and then keep giving self-disclosures until I get two pieces of free information back. And you're going to learn something real quick. First thing you're going to learn is a lot of women really suck at conversation. Yeah, they've had a head start on us and they tend to be more social creatures. But spot of the tism knows no gendered boundaries, especially today. Some women give one word answers. Maybe they're not interested. Maybe they don't know how to be interested. Maybe they just suck at talking. Second thing you're going to learn is the power of assumptions. So these free disclosures, instead of using your free disclosure as asking them questions and building in this whole yes or no question thing, you're going to learn how to properly prepare a question or better yet, make an accusation. This is one of those, and I can't remember where it's from. I want to say mystery, but whatever. The point is walk up and say something. Old man conversation from Roos talks about this. Think of it like 
You look like one of those girls that probably has an iMac in her backpack. One of those hipster types, aren't you? But that's the point. It doesn't really matter how awkward it sounds, whatever. You look at a girl, make a surface level ac accusation, make it obviously not the kind of thing that somebody would be proud of, but also not too harmful. It's like a nag sort of, but not nag in the way that feminists think about it, where you're trying to gaslight a girl. It's just more a playful way to get somebody to open themselves up. And it's because of this very simple human need to correct people. If you ever, if you don't believe me how it works, say something wrong on the internet and say something right on the internet. See which two of those statements get more engagement. And I guarantee you it's the wrong statement. So while you go leading forward with something that's obviously wrong and not too hurtful, like don't say, oh, you look like one of those, you know, sluts that just sleeps the guy on Tinder and never calls him back. That's just going to throw somebody off. That's being very socially uncalibrated and essentially leading with meanness. And you don't want that. You're trying to make acquaintances here, friends, or smash later. So yeah, you look like one of those hipsters that own an iMac. Is that your thing? Oh, no, 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 that's not me. And then, you know, I'm I'm definitely an Android user. Or for some reason, she's one of the girls that uses a Windows phone. Don't ask me why. Or That's the point. You're, you're reading books? Oh, that book's nice. I take it you're one of those Fifty Shades of Grey kind of people. Again, it's not... It's not insulting, it's not offensive, but it's the kind of thing that is probably wrong. And even if a girl does like Fifty Shades of Grey, she's more than happy to correct you on it. No, no, no. I'm more of like a, you know, science fiction fan. This is actually Dune. I don't think any girl's ever going to say that, but you get the point. Now you're getting free information. And then you can practice on this for your communication skills. So you want to practice one element of disclosure, be very good at it to be able to get a piece of information, a free disclosure from somebody else. And this is where that opening the communication starts. Never disagree, never argue, never say but, but say and. So for example, you could get information you don't agree with. You could say, oh, what's that book? Are you reading like Dune by Frank Herbert? Oh, no, no, no. This is actually Hillary Clinton's autobiography. I've been reading it ever since the election because I hate Trump. Most guys are going to start arguing, well, what are you talking about? He's making America great again and blah, blah, blah. Right there, that guy's going home sexless. <laughs> He's going to end up having a jerk around in his living room. You know what I mean? The point isn't the conversation topic. The point is conversation as a skill set. Oh, Hillary is president. That's awesome. Were you like, were you like one of those Bernie guys? Like I can, I used to be one of those Bernie guys and then I had to switch over. Cause obviously, I mean, you only have one or two choices. You're making it up. You don't really care, but that's the point. Nobody cares who you voted for in that example. But then she goes, I know me too. I would have rather Bernie won. And then now politics isn't the greatest example of this, but that's the point. It's something we can all understand intuitively here that you give a self-disclosure in this case, like an accusation questions. I don't like because questions are too easy for one word answers, but wrong information is corrected with free information. So then you get that, you get free information back. You pick, if you get more than one piece of free information, pick the element that you know best. And if you don't know, then just pick one randomly, whichever is like seems more important for the other person. So, for example, I'm pretty good with art. I've got a degree in uh, graphic design with art history. That's my first degree. So if I start talking to somebody about, you know, a book they're reading and they'll talk about it. And I notice that Frank Fazetta has the cover of the book. She goes, yeah, I'm actually a really fan of this book. My ex-boyfriend left it at my place and I decided to start reading it. So right there, I know she's single. She's in between relationships. So she's probably just going to want to rebound. She's totally fun and DTF. That's my initial assumptions, but I can flesh that out. So what do I want to talk about? Well, we just met. I don't want to talk about smashing right away. She doesn't even know who I am. I'm just at the opener right now. And you kind of learn that from before with like uh, the mystery method and setting your stuff inside like a, a structure. So you're like, oh yeah, I love the artist in on this one. That's Frank Fazetta's work. And then I can talk at length about that. And that's self-disclosure to the other person. Oh, so he's an artist type. He's creative. He's socially not awkward enough to jump on me with like a, hey, as soon as I talk about an ex-boyfriend or if she says she has a boyfriend, which could be a lie. Every girl says that. It just shows I'm not phased by it. So I'm not here to be like a creepy guy and only out there for sex, even though you kind of are. But you're able to answer. It's like that preemptive, you know, we're not having sex tonight, right? Where you're able to preemptively show social awareness enough that when that situation comes up, she's comfortable enough to even have that conversation. And these things here are huge. Not only are they good assertive, tactic, assertive tactics and assertive strategies, they're good from a game standpoint. Again, you could do all the, the scripted stuff. You can do the rote routines and they're kind of old and they're kind of dated and they're not very authentic. But here's the thing. Once you understand the principles, 
It's a very easy system. Ask somebody questions or make an accusation. Out of that, you're going to get free information so long as you didn't make it a yes or no question because yes and no don't say anything. You want somebody to articulate on the answer. And if they do end up giving like a one word answer, make an assumption on that one. Oh, you're a big fan of that book? No. Well, that makes sense because I normally meet a lot of people who read books they aren't interested in. I guess that must be the problem when you're having to be a professional book reviewer. Well, actually, I'm not a book reviewer. I just, you know, reading it because a friend suggested it and I got nothing else to do right now. Bam, free information. Person's bored. They have nothing to do. And so you being a source of entertainment just by being there. That's a shot right in your arm right there of confidence. Awesome. So here, I'm actually more much more interesting than this book here. So tell me about something. And you know what I mean? Then you kind of just, it's a back and forth process. You get better at communication. You don't actually have to agree with or enjoy any part of the communication. Now we can make a grander picture about how right now it's very hard for people to talk to each other. Like there's very hard lines drawn between tribes. You can't talk about controversial topics. You know, cancel culture is real. Arguably this skill is the way to kind of broach that. And I'm not going to say you're going to save the West from that, but being able to have a conversation with somebody you're diametrically opposed to while still keeping it light enough and not to that point of escalation is a superpower. Like I myself, I still talk with people that I don't agree with when it comes to like politics. For us, it's like, are you pro-Trudeau or are you anti-Trudeau? And I kind of have a nuanced opinion on that. Not that it's important for this, but the point is I can talk with people that I disagree with on a very large amount of topics. But you learn through the skills of free information and self-disclosure, you can kind of work out where the good places are, where the bad places are to touch subjects and back off from them. So that way you're able to navigate a conversation and come out from it a better person whether it's about smashing, more enlightened, or just avoiding being canceled because you want to have a topic at work to talk about that's very important. Um, carrying on then. So, so far, I have mostly talked about our verbal behavior with other people. The aim of systematic assertive practices is to present a person who is self-assured and adept in dealing with other people in conflict and confidence. Your assertive impact upon other people will likely be ineffective if at the same time you show them observable anxiety cues. We all know people who say one thing and whose body language says another. So while others may not be able to put their finger on the cues that tell them we're anxious, that we're still able to interpret them correctly. The most obvious cue that you're nervous in dealing somebody is a lack of eye-to-eye -eye contact. That's a huge thing, by the way. Making eye contact when you're talking. Again, this is... My girl actually makes fun of me because she sees I still kind of do it sometimes where if she's telling me a story and I have zero interest in it, I have like a eye contact two, three, all right, break eye contact, eye contact, two, three, break eye contact. It's just because if I just show my real intentions of being bored as hell with this conversation, she gets mad, it can escalate to a fight, and I'm just not in the mood for it. So in this case, she's been really good to me, so I see no reason not to have her like as a springboard to whatever, you know, stuff she wants to talk about. She has friends for that, but you know, as a guy, sometimes you just got to be there as the oak. And this is one of those like leading conversation things. So she can tell what I'm doing it now. And she always pokes fun. I'm like, look, you've been really, you're awesome right now. I'm giving you the best I can do with the conversation because I really don't care about Cindy from accounting. So just go. <laughs> She's like, all right, fine. And she rambles on about it. It just shows you care. And if somebody earns it, why not? Uh, the body language part on here. So for further reading on this, I mean, obviously, if you haven't been on it, uh, John from body, like John from uh, the Rule Zero group there. Modern Life Dating, he's doing his body language course right now where he actually has a nice video series on how to pick up on like a sexual subset of body language cues. If you want to expand on it more, Joe Navarro has a, has a book, What Every Body Is Thinking, and he talks about it in a more general sense as far as like interrogation techniques. What does somebody have when they have anxiety? What does somebody have when they're hiding something? What do they have when they're confrontational? When you're using... Those first two skills of uh, full dis of disclosure and free information, a lot of the time, somebody might just be being polite with you. We'll use an example here. A lot of guys, when they first run Dread Game because they're in a sexless relationship and they're going to work on it, they start practicing game and they'll hit on the waitress from that the restaurant. It's like, hey, I showed my wife how alpha I was. This girl at Applebee's, she smiled at me, you know? 
Now, had they paid attention to this eye contact part, this body language part, which the wife is very, like, girls are naturally good at body language cues because they've had their whole life to practice where you've only had the last, like, six months. They'll notice that the waitress is just being polite because that's her job. You know, freezing up if the guy starts flirting when she didn't ask for it, that sort of stuff. And part of practicing this stuff, if you're not good at it, is understanding these body language cues. Now, it's a lot to take in. You can't just sit somebody down, give them this, give them Joe Navarro's group and two weeks of John's body language mastery course. And like, there you go. Go practice a conversation. Guys are going to screw everything up because it's too many things to keep in your head at once. So what you generally do is break it down. And that's why we have the uh, approach anxiety desensitization things where walk up and ask 50 people for the time. And that's just getting you used to making eye contact and talking to somebody for 30 seconds. Expanding on it to where um, I'm going to give somebody a self-disclosure and a conversation through a question and try and get free information back. You're going to fail a bunch, get some yes or no answers. It's going to be a struggle, a bit of a slog. Eventually learn the accusations work better or non-binary questions. And then you're going to get free information back. All right, so I did it once. Now I'm going to try and do it. Take that one free information and turn it into a second self-disclosure. And then we have a conversation. Awesome. Now I'm going to see if I can keep it going for five minutes, for ten minutes. I'm going to try getting a number afterwards. I'm going to try seeing if she wants to go on an instant date afterwards. Like all these kind of things build up. And as you're doing this, so when you're going from, for example, okay, first full disclosure to uh, free information worked. Now I'm going to start watching body language. I want to do... Uh, uh, do the example here, but I'm going to aim for getting indicators of interest or positive body language. And that's making sure yourself, okay, shoulders back, eyes straight, make the eye contact, be smiling and friendly, non, non-aggressive. And then you get signs from the other back, a positive feedback loop. So you're doing that same back and forth progress, but you're now doing it with body language because you've practiced this conversation technique enough that you don't have to particularly think about it. And then, sure, over six months to a year, depending on how far behind you are. I mean, most guys most guys don't come at this from a 0 out of 10 position. Most guys understand, like, to a good extent, let's say 7 out of 10, how to hold a conversation with people. And so with these things, these steps largely, like, you'll skip certain steps, you'll do other things, that you do them out of order. But that's the point. You're shoring up your weaknesses. You're building... You're no longer being unattractive. And that's generally the rule for attraction. You know, be attractive, don't be unattractive. Lifting, working out is great, but learning how not to be unattractive and holding in the gym, also great. So he has learners practice this exercise on their own with friends, spouses, or whoever you can get to sit down with you for a couple times a week for three weeks. In class, immediately after this exercise, I have the same partners practice eye-to-eye contact with repeating the last part of the social conversation exercise. Most people find it difficult to look somebody in the eye when they're answering a question or making a verbal statement. They make it, they find it difficult to concentrate. But that's the thing. Building on these things, piecemeal, are how you end up building these skills to the point where you can have a seamless conversation and you look just like a natural. Instead of learning it at, you know, 10 years old, like social Bobby from down the street learned, you're learning at 26 year old as a STEM graduate. No shame in that. You had to learn sometime and it's better late than never. So a couple things. So from a red pill lens, this doesn't quite go as well as he does there with that men and women are equal thing. So I've added some links in the description here. The first one we're going to talk about is one from Ian Ironwood, one of the old married guys. He calls him an OMG type. Wrote about the female social matrix. Now he contraposes that the male social matrix is about initial fitness testing and then wholehearted acceptedness. Uh, you meet a guy, you're, let's say, let's go squash for the squash example. You meet a guy at the squash club, you're playing squash together, you're good at squash. That's your initial fitness test. You can play the game that you're there to play. So wholehearted acceptness. Awesome. Play a couple games together. That's how it works. And then maybe you join a squash club. At the squash club, they're like, yeah, you just got to make sure you pay your fees, uh, show up on time. And when somebody has a match, if you have to cancel, give them 24 hours notice. You meet that very simple entrance exam, and now you're part of the club. And that's how males bond. Women aren't quite the same. In this one, he talks about how women automatically accept themselves. Oh, you should join You should join the squash club with Cindy. Yeah, sure, we'll do that. And then it's constant status jockeying and uh, subterfuge, power games, that sort of thing. Maybe she's, you know, and 
I shouldn't have to explain this. Anybody, even watch reality TV, you're watching the female social matrix in action. Even though it's artificial, it's like a hyper version of it. So that's a good read for it. Um, another thing to add here, and here's a good thing to know about the difference between men and women when it comes to communication and how this stuff is applied. Second one is the tangled chains on the swing set of solipsism. Now, let me pull up the part I'm looking for here. There it is. So this is how women converse. I've said it a bunch. Everything a woman said is, is through her ego. And a lot of guys take that to mean women equal narcissist. And that's not entirely true. Obviously more so than they used to be, but that's not what we're talking about here. To quote, in other words, women have a greater sense of self-importance and sensitivity to their personal actions than men. Signs of solipsism. Remember, Solipsism isn't selfishness, as many Manospherians mistakenly believe. It's more akin to self-involvement. And that can be a positive or a negative thing. A woman can be completely giving to the people in her life, sacrificing much, and still be utterly solipsistic. By putting nearly every issue in terms of how does this affect me, or how do my actions affect others, the female solipsistically maintains the frame that she has herself at the center of the picture. She might be selfless, but she still has the self in front and center. The example he uses here is of charities, where if you're put in a situation like uh, maybe you're doing cleanup after a natural disaster, maybe you're in a charity, a guy will generally approach that on, okay, what needs to be done? So the charity is the center of attention. What actions need to go to accomplish this goal? And that's our mission-driven mindset. That's the initial fitness testing. What actions here do I need to do for that initial fitness testing and we could be part of this charity group? When a girl will generally approach it from, what can I do? And that's that's solipsism in a nutshell. They're very perceptive to that. So this is, again, two good supplementary reads on this. Now, how does this apply to conversations? Well, it matters a lot. So first off, you learn how to communicate, like understand womanese, but speak in manlish is the term, or manglish. So you understand how women talk to their girlfriends, that in, that wholehearted acceptness and constant status jockeying. Now, guys who become emotional tampons and listen too much to how the women talk, this is how they end up becoming friend-zoned and put into the girlfriend zone. It's they start communicating from these female social matrix rules. And wholehearted acceptedness. Automatically falling for a girl instantly is wholehearted acceptedness. You don't know her no you don't know her name, you don't know her flaws, you don't know her phone number. You don't know what she's like at her worst or at her best. And that's the point. You don't know any of this stuff. And then all of a sudden you're acting as if you're besties right away. Right there, that gives a curl the so in the same way I said you got to pay attention to self-disclosure that you're giving. You're self-disclosing here that I'm going to talk to you like a woman and you need to talk to and treat me like a woman. Ergo, I don't want to smash. I'm your gay best friend. Not what you want to do. Again, so the more you understand about the female communication matrix, the more you can start acting like a man, which in this case is you're not wholeheartedly accepting her. There is a certain fitness testing involved. And this is where things like uh, nagging and pressure flips and negative inquiries come in handy. So, for example, uh, you start asking a question. She gives you kind of like a really snide answer because, well, he wholeheartedly accepted me. So I'm going to like undermine him here by acting like I'm higher status than him. This is where you laugh it off. You're like, look, I don't know you, lady. Uh, but you know what I mean? Some kind of amuse mastery, some kind of a green amplify, some kind of fogging. The purpose of this then establishes on that hierarchy. Are you better than me than worse than me? She acts better than you. You laugh it off. You're not you're not playing a posturing game with her because you don't have to because you're above her. Again, you're playing the game, but you're playing to win. Oh, that's cute, little girl. You want a piece of this? All right. And that's where self-deprecation can come in handy. So, for example, if she's like, yeah, I've, I'm just not illiterate like some of you guys out there. It's like, yeah, I'm pretty illiterate. I bang rocks and sticks together. But that's the point. It shows it's not a threat. It's not a status game, which automatically and counterintuitively sometimes places you as higher status. Because if you're insecure, the, remember when I said before how the people love to correct information? Well, here's an example. If she's wrong and guessed you as a simp, if you're insecure about that, even a little bit, the first thing you're going to do is defend your honor. I'm not a simp. I'm a real man. And they pick up on that and they go, oh, okay. Insecure guy. I'm already above him on some hierarchy. I win. 
I win the social matrix for women. Totally shot yourself in the foot. Again, a man's side, I'm not here to compete with you. I'm here to see if you're worth more of my time. And that's the subtext. And that's the frame walking into an interaction. I don't care if it's a wife. I don't care if it's a girlfriend, a coworker, or a complete stranger that maybe you want to smash later. Each time you walk into it with that irrational confidence to know that this conversation is going well. If she starts giving you those tests as a female social matrix thing to pull you into her frame of that validation seeking frame. No, I'm speaking man terms. Uh, if she acts really complaining, it's like, do you always treat people like this? Or are you generally like a pleasant person if you want to be? And then whatever, that's a, that's a disclosure. And then you're going to get free information. And then she may bring up like, sorry, I'm having a bad day. Uh, my ex dumped me today or, you know, whatever the story is. But then again, there's your self-disclosure. There's your free information. You've used the tools that we've already learned. Like we've gone over Amuse Mastery in previous episodes. Uh, no more Mr. Nice Guy. We've gone over Agree and Amplify. We've gone over Fogging. If you really want a primer on it, I got a salsa video where I talk about this stuff. I got a pancake video. I got French toast video. Watch them all. They're 10 minutes a piece and they'll get you on one of these concepts. And then once you understand it, okay, so now I know I'm playing on my rules. I'm playing with my frame. I understand she's trying to pull me into a female social matrix and I need to do a guy one. Now this sounds super autistic and it kind of is. But ideally when this stuff happens, it should be kind of subconscious. You're not going to have to think about it. It's just intuitive. And that's with anything. Anything you do for a long period of time, you start with the training wheels, left foot, right foot. That's how you pedal. Turn this way. Don't turn that way. Faster keeps you upright. When you stop, put your leg down before you crash. But now you're just pointing your bike and steering in a direction. But that's how he says three weeks. I would argue anywhere from six months to two years, depending on who you're talking to. Now to expand on this one again, there's another guide by uh, Blarg Risen. I put the link in that description to this one as well. A complete idiot's guide to conversation. And he's expanding on another post, which we'll end this on, which is pretty interesting. So he talks about like even before saying hi, there's a whole host of situational and social awareness that you can cue in on to determine if a conversation with somebody is going to be worth it for you and worth it for them. There are things you usually don't notice because in your head, you're thinking about this bundle of thoughts about how to converse and what to talk about and things can go wrong that you don't actually pay attention to what's going on. You're in a fog and you miss these signs. And this is why you need to practice this stuff. So that way you don't have to focus on left foot, right foot. I say this, then I say that A plus B equals C. It's no, it's just look at the situation, read the room, go in and have your conversation. Are they ready for a conversation? Girl at the gym with the headset in, sweating her ass off, not wearing any makeup, probably has a giant shield up saying, don't approach me. So walking up to her and saying, hey, do you mind holding my protein shake for me? It's probably not going to go well. And it takes an understanding of body language and those social cues to understand that. But at the same time, if you want to work in on the equipment she's in, a tap on the shoulder. Hey, can I work in with you? And you Or are you done here in a set or two? And that's a simple conversation. Now, this one is just going to be, you know, acquaintances. You're not going to be able to get an F close off of that in the gym. But that's the point. You're not there to try and sleep with her. You're there to have a conversation of meaning. You want to do bench press and she's hogging the bench. So you ask her if you can work in in between sets. Now there's a way you can do it while being socially aware enough to know that she has that I don't want to talk. So right there, you got your time constraint, same as you would any other opener. Here, uh, can I work in with you here? Or or do you only have like, how many more sets do you have? Or something like that. She'll say, I got one more set, then it's all yours. Perfect, thanks. Then that's easy enough for you. You go do your workout. She does hers, maybe later on. You walk by each other as you're leaving. Hey, thanks a lot for that later or that thing, by the way. And then you can have a conversation. You build a rapport. Bam, you've got an acquaintance. An acquaintance may be a friend. She has a friend who's single. You guys meet afterwards at the, at the pub or you see her downtown when you're just shopping. And that's how these things happen. There's hundreds of these interactions throughout the day. And you don't know which one's going to blossom and which one isn't. So you're casting a giant net with these conversational techniques to build your social circle. Again, 60 Days of Dread. It's a wonderful resource. Go through the host of them on here. He makes a link to it here. Um, and he kind of, again, very systematic on this one. And this is what's going to go to the other link, the week eight social life of the 60 days of dread. This one is good too, because it really lays it out. Like you can tell this guy's a lawyer. So first off, he makes the case about, and here's a lot of guys will say, well, why do I need to learn all this stuff for this? I don't feel like it. I'm an introvert. I'm ENTJ or INTP or FUC off. You know what I mean? And they'll bang, I don't want to be this super social guy. I just want to go on online dating, swipe right, and then we go on a date. It's like, he makes the case for it. 
the loneliness epidemic as a person we're a social species so if you don't want this stuff this is like the guy telling you sex isn't important or i don't feel like eating this month like they're lying to you and it's a coping strategy understand part of the human condition is being a social creature the most alpha people in fact in the social environment aren't the strongest men aren't the biggest men aren't the guys who can throw the strongest punch it's the guys that are best able to build up a network of men who are good enough in those alpha characteristics. Like, a band has five people in it. All five of them. They're not the most alpha men you've seen. They're probably lanky guys. They're probably nerds in high school. But between the five of them, they built up a nice hierarchy, a nice status, and now they're all the top of the F pile at their thing. But that's the point. Those guys are going to do much better than the gym cell who thinks, I'm just going to work out, be big, be swole, and the girls are going to flock to me. It's like, that's not how they work. They'll flock to you if you have muscles, if you have the status and pre-selection that goes with it, and you make the effort to have a conversation with them, and you do that burden of performance from the guy side. So, he makes a good case for that. Talks about the assumptions that you make and why they're ridiculous. It's definitely a good one for it. He talks about relationships and networks and building your network. Now, I like this because people talk about networking all wrong, and they talk about it like, you just want to meet as many people and have as many people know your name as possible. When in reality, it's like, no, it's about building relationships because those are the ones that carry forward. He mentions in his law practice, a lot of guys that kind of know him as acquaintances, they know his name, but when they know somebody who needs a lawyer, they don't think to mention him. So he takes those acquaintances to as close to friends as he can by like actively working to build a lot of acquaintance nodes. So what I talked, I don't know if I talked about it before or not, but your squash buddy, go out drinking, that's two nodes. You get a third node, maybe you also, you know, whatever it is you do. As long as there's three activities that you associate with the same acquaintance, they're kind of moved up into a relationship, a friend of some sort, like low-key friends. Those are the people that, hey, I got a lawyer friend you should probably talk to, and that's real networking. Again, we could talk about day game, we can talk about night game, we could talk about online dating. All of their success rates are abysmal. Every day gamer will tell you, even if you're top of the top of the pile, top tier man, 100% on game with the perfect openers, 10% max, probably more like 5%. Online dating for a lot of guys is even less sometimes. Sometimes I've heard 2% thrown around. Night game, same thing. You're going to get 20, 30 rejections in a night, but by that 31st, maybe. Here's the thing though. It's all moving towards social circle game because social circle game has a crazy closure rate. Especially if you're with a group of friends that's uh, socially active, there'll be guys in your social circle that have slept with all the girls in your social circle. And you want to be one of those guys. And that's the thing. You just build a large social circle and you're getting 20, 30% closure rates there because you've already come with your pre-selection. You've gone through the dance. Your communication skills are good. You're top tier. You work out. You look good. You smell good. Maybe you taste good too. Let's find out. This stuff all builds on each other. And it's not just sex. It's not just relationships. One of those guys, I just got a job at Deloitte. We have an opening for a consultant in your field. Dude, come on over. We need to work together. That would be awesome. Bam. $20,000 raise. Sweet contracting job. But that's the point. And he talks here. Here's the part I love where he actually brings back the male and the female social matrix to it. Where he shows... The female social matrix terms and then their male equivalents. So in this case, women, crabs in a bucket. And that's that constant jockeying for position. It's a reference from fishing where uh, people who crab catch crab for a living, they put them in a bucket once they catch the crabs and they find you don't even have to put a lid on it because all the crabs are trying to get out of the bucket. So when one crab claws above everybody else, they claw at him to try and crawl above them. And so they all pull themselves back in and they actually don't need any kind of restraint to keep them in the bucket. And that's the idea of the girls sabotaging everybody else around them to feel better, but everybody's doing it, so they all have this middling level of quality. Again, men, encouraging social ascent. That's the male way of doing it. Build everybody up. A rising tide lifts all boats. I think that's the Reagan term for it. Women are all about equality. Men are all about competition. Women, disprogress beyond the group dynamic. Men, spur on progress. Are you happy for your buddy for doing better, or are you jealous and trying to shoot him down? Social niceties, pleasant demeanor, female thing. For men, ribbing each other, critiquing each other, you know, busting their balls. Focused on the group or focused on the role within the group, just like I talked about before. What can I do versus what needs to be done? 
Plausible deniability versus overt expression. Girls say what gets them in the least amount of responsibility. Guys say what they mean and mean what they say. And then you kind of learn these differences between manglish and womanese. Women are about being fair. Guys are about being efficient. Girls, consensus and democracy. Men are about hierarchy. Women are about everybody involvement. Everybody gets a trophy. Guys are about achievement. Best man take all. Again, take these supplementary reads. Go through them along with. And you're going to find these skills help you not only in dating, but in just generally being more of a top tier man. And all those social ramifications, your increases in business, your increases in friends, those actually have a feedback loop because that pre-selection now makes you more attractive with women and it all builds on each other. So that's the episode here. Um, I noticed you guys have been super busy in the chat. Don't forget, by the way, smash the like button. If you like this content, subscribe. Share it with your buddies on social media. You know the drill. Um, I see a bunch of guys from the Patreon group in there, by the way. If you haven't gone, link for that one's in the description. Come check it out. I don't charge. It's only like five bucks a month, like a fancy coffee. I don't charge until the end of the month because I'm confident when guys come in there, they start seeing the rewards, the uh, the Q&As we do, the very private chats where we kind of let all the filters off. We don't worry about language filter or topics. The locker room, like I said, the in online forum space we have where guys can swap notes about stuff that's rather private with some discretion because obviously you can't be 100% open on the internet because God knows who's listening. So all these things add together. <laughs> and then I see you guys in there trying to trying to <laughs> jerk me around calling me coach, you sonza. Anyways, so that's the episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, next one is going to be assertively coping with the great manipulator criticism. So remember before when I said nothing makes somebody more engaging than correcting wrong information? Well, this criticism part is going to focus on that a lot. We're probably going to do it tomorrow at same day. Um, Again, probably beforehand, I'm going to do a little pre-show thing. Uh, Today I was on Twitch playing Mega Man 2, so we'll see what happens tomorrow. Anyways, come check that one out too, but I'll catch you guys on the next one. Let's do the intro. Ha! All right, enjoy your lunch. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, fellas. Thanks for liking the camera, by the way. I've added... I've started adding LUTs to it. So we're doing, like, uh, color correction. Like I said, I want to give you guys the quality. But anyways, we're ending the stream, so you do what you do.